Happy Sabbath. It's an honor to be here. I think before I, I speak this morning, you got to know a little bit more. Thank you for allowing me to remove my mask. That's wonderful. Even before, this is fine. This is just fine. Thank you. Even before I got to speak this morning, you knew a little bit about me. So I was not ready for that, but thank you, May, for letting them know that I was a bit naughty. Hopefully things have changed <laughs> over time. Uh, I cannot thank uh, the conference enough for the hospitality that they have shown me so far. And I have had the privilege to get to know some of you and, and share a meal with some of you. And I praise God for that. I think uh, many people around the world are hospitable. But hospitality in Singapore has a special brand. Do you agree with me? Yes. Amen. <laughs> It is a privilege for me to present uh, God's Word and let you know that people from all over the world are watching this worship service. <laughs> I would like to say hello to my parents, my brother, my friends online. They are watching too. They are joining us for worship. So we are interconnected. We are truly an international church. Let us go together to the director's cut because during the scripture reading, you saw the trailer talking about Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. You watched the trailer as Esther was reading to us. Jesus saw a couple of people doing their thing. He told them, follow me, and they followed. But that's the trailer of the movie. I want you to watch the director's cut in Luke chapter 5. But before we dive into God's word, I would like to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us this morning. As we open the scriptures. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you are giving me to present your word, your message. Be with us, Lord. May your Holy Spirit enlighten our minds and touch our hearts so we may understand the sermon, the message that you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go with me to Luke chapter 5 with your phone, with your Bible. Luke chapter 5, and we will start reading in verse 3. Luke chapter 5, verse 3. Jesus is passing by. He comes to the shore of Gennesaret. He sees two boats, and he decides... To do something about it. Verse 3, I read for you. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. So I want you to notice that Jesus is a carpenter. He has nothing to do with fishermen. But he goes there and he tells Peter, you know, Peter, I need your boat. Now, we may think that Jesus needed the boat for several reasons. But I would dare to say, because they didn't have a nice PA system like we do here, Jesus used the boat as a platform to address the many people that were following him. So I want you to picture that moment with me. Jesus goes to the lake, he goes to the shore, and he decides to tell everyone from the boat what he's teaching. And everything is okay so far. Peter is washing his nets. His friends are washing the nets too. And Jesus says something shocking in verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. I want you to carefully see here how Jesus, who is a carpenter, goes all the way to the lake of Gennesaret, gets to the shore, tells Peter, I want to use your boat as a PA system, and now he gets into Peter's business and tells Peter, I want you to go out there and I want you to let your nets down. And we all know what Peter said, right? This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's what? A carpenter. 
He's not a fisherman like me. Normally we do this at nighttime. During daytime, the fish get scared. Lord, we struggled. We worked hard the whole night. Why are you telling me to go out there again? And I can imagine what happened when Peter was speaking. I can see Jesus' face doing something like this. And that's why Peter said, Okay, okay, I'll do it. I know I worked hard. I know I tried my best. But because of your facial expression, okay, I'll try. In your name, I will let the nets down. When we read the story, we notice that Peter was at the shore washing his nets after a long night. And Jesus was the one who was looking for him. How intentional Jesus was to go to the shore, meet Peter, use his boat, and then tell him, go out there and catch some fish. Do you know that this is the story of the plan of salvation? Who looks for who first? Do we look for God first or does God look for us? Bible 101, theology 101, gospel 101. Who looks for who first? If you read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to paraphrase it. The Bible says that since and before the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God was slain. Ain't that interesting? The plan of salvation was in place even before we sinned. God is really proactive. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says that when we were sinners... God died for us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says that He loved us first, then we loved Him. Well, since May shared a little bit about me, I'm going to share a little bit about her. Do you think that's fair? I would call it fair and square, right? She had the chance, I get the chance too. Who do you think <laughs> I might be in trouble after this. Who do you think looked for who? I guess I don't have to answer that. And many, many times when we talk about the past and how we met each other, I always tell her, remember, I looked for you first. And this is what God tells us in the Bible. I looked for you first. And this is the first phase of the discipleship cycle. God meets us where we are. Ain't that something? I want you to remember one more time what I just said a few minutes ago. Peter was at the shore washing his nets. Jesus went there, a carpenter. He had nothing to do with that job. But he went there, he looked for Peter, he got into Peter's business and he said, go out there and catch some fish. Let us continue reading what happened. Verse 6, when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. But remember, the nets were washed. They should be fine, but the nets are breaking. Verse 7, so they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats. And they began to sink. Do you see the movement in the story? From empty nets and empty boats to breaking nets and sinking boats. What made the difference? Jesus, he was looking for Peter. He told Peter, this is what you must do. And Peter followed. And I want you to read what happens in verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Does that make sense? Does it make sense to you? 
that Peter saw a great quantity of fish and suddenly he feels like recognizing he's a sinner? That doesn't make sense to me. How are fish and sin related? If you think for a moment, why would Peter say something like that? And as I was preparing the sermon for today, and let me tell you, I thought long and hard about what to preach to you. Long and hard. Because I don't know the needs of the church. I don't get to know you. Only if I visit you, I get to know what would be the best sermon for the church every Sabbath. So I prayed about it and I asked the Lord, Lord, show me. And this passage kept coming back to me. Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5. So I was impressed to preach about chapter 5. And that's what we are doing today. We are studying God's Word. And when I read this verse, I understood something. God uses tangible things to show us intangible realities. Did you hear that? Should I say it one more time? God uses what we can see so we understand what we can't see or touch. Fish and sin are not related. But that was the powerful means that Jesus used to show Peter, I am God. I am the Son of the Most High. You are in the presence of the divine. And that's why Peter, on the boat, falls at Jesus' feet and says, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. But this is not the full picture. Ellen G. White gives us the full picture of how Peter said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. If you go to the Desire of Ages, and you can check it out on your phone. If you go to the Desire of Ages, page 246, Sister White says that as Peter was saying, I don't know if this is culturally acceptable here. I would need a volunteer, but I hope you can picture what I'm saying. I'll try my best to demonstrate. Ellen G. White says that as Peter confessed, go away from me for I am a sinful man, Peter knelt down and he clung to Jesus' feet. Can you picture that? Can you picture Peter saying, go away from me? But at the same time, he's hugging Jesus' feet. This is a classic example of how verbal language sometimes is not in agreement with nonverbal language. With his mouth, he's confessing, I am a sinful man. Go away from me. But with his arms, with his body, he's embracing Jesus and saying, I cannot go away from you. Have you experienced that? That kind of conflict? that kind of inner controversy in your heart, you know that what you're doing is wrong. You know that your life is not right. You know that you don't deserve to be called a child of God. But at the same time, you know that you cannot walk away from Him. Amen. So the good news of the gospel is when you feel unworthy, when you feel like you're not enough when you feel like God is so holy and you are so sinful, let me tell you this morning, you're on the right track. That's what the Bible is telling us. And this is the second phase of discipleship. God shows us who He is. He's holy. He's so powerful. And who we are. And how desperately we need Him. And that's why Peter was saying with his mouth, go away. But with his arms, I shall not let you go. Verse 9, for amazement had seized him, and not only him, but all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. Remember, from something tangible to something intangible. And this is when things get very interesting. Verse 10, And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. And I praise God for His love and His care for us. 
when we feel that we are not enough, that we are not worthy, that we are sinful, God says, do not fear. I love you. I accept you as you are, and I will transform you if you allow me. Do not fear. From now on, you will be catching. What does it say? That's a big difference. From catching men. That's a long, long way from catching fish. How is it possible that you can catch people? What is Jesus trying to say? And I will share something that really, really caught my attention. And this is one more example of how God uses something tangible to demonstrate something intangible. Is Jesus a fisherman? No. But he's the savior of the world. Correct? Jesus caught fish for Peter so he could catch Peter. Am I making sense? Let me say it again. Jesus caught fish for Peter so he could catch Peter. And Peter, who is used to catching fish, now is ordained as a minister of the gospel to go and catch did you ever think about this? This way. Jesus did what Peter was used to do so that Peter now can do what Jesus does. And that's the third phase of discipleship. We understand that we are to come and follow what Jesus does. And that's why I call it the discipleship cycle because it starts with God. And we'll go clockwise here. We start with God looking for us. That's phase one. Then we move to understanding who God is and who we are and how much we need Him. That's phase two. But then we get to phase three and it comes full circle. God tells us, did you see what I did for you? Now I want you to go out there and tell others what I did for you. So He started looking for us. He showed us who we are and who He is. And now He tells us, Go and tell others, I am finding them. Amen? And that's the mission of the church. That's it. Then we can talk about Daniel. We can talk about Revelation. We can talk about the 28 fundamental beliefs. We can say all that all day long. But the basics are so important. And sometimes we forget the basics. And when we forget the basics, we get in trouble. Many times we want to go to phase three of the discipleship cycle. Oh, let's go out there and tell people. But do we understand phase one? Do we understand that God meets us where we are? Exactly as we are? Do we experience phase two? Do we know who God is and who we are? Then we are ready to go into phase three. I really don't know how much time we have left. And I'm sure I will get another chance to tell you more about my story, either here or in heaven. But it was a challenge for me when Jesus told me, follow me. It was not easy. I was getting ready to become a concert pianist. I had passed all the tests to do that. And I was ready to dedicate my life to music. And at some point I thought, I prefer glory, fame, and honor rather than Jesus. At some point in my life I was thinking that way. And the Lord started to bother me. No, I am calling you to be a fisher of men. Why do you want to go that way? Since you were born, I have been training you to do this. Why do you want to go in a different direction? Like Peter, I was saying, I know what I'm doing. Don't tell me what to do. I know my business. But God said, no, you get to get out there and do what I tell you to do. I come from Cuba. Cuba is a communist country. It is a miracle to get out of Cuba. Even just to visit another country. And when I was in that struggle... I met Clifford Goldstein. 
the editor of the Sabbath School Quarterly. And I told him what I was going through. And he told me, don't worry. If the Lord calls you, you have to accept and who knows, maybe he even takes you out of Cuba just to show you how powerful he is. When he said that, I laughed. You know, sometimes we laugh at people. We don't believe what the Lord is telling us through them. And I laughed. And after that, I met another pastor from the General Conference, Claude Richley. And I told him my story, and he told me exactly the same thing that Clifford had told me. You need to serve the Lord. That's what God wants you to do. And he said, but you know what? I think you should go to Asia. Cubano. In Asia. What was he talking about? I had no idea. And I said, okay, if you think that way, okay, let's see what happens. So we started the visa process. And I went, I went to the Thai consulate in Cuba. And I got there with my passport and everything. And I said, I would like to go to Thailand and study in Thailand. You remember when I laughed at Clifford for saying that maybe the Lord would call me out of Cuba to serve him? The lady laughed at me. She said, there's no way, no way you get a student visa to go to Thailand. No way, with emphasis. I said, okay, I went back home. Three hours later, the lady was calling me on the phone. The consul came, checked your application, and you got your student visa. I don't hear anyone saying amen. amen. I got to the airport, and I hear my name through the speakers. Passenger Roger O'Connor, please come to gate 23. I thought, this is over. <laughs> this is it. I am not going anywhere. I got to gate 23, and I said, good morning, good morning. Uh, I am Roger. Uh, you were calling me through the speakers. Yes, sir, we have a problem. I said, okay, I'm ready for this. You know, I'm ready because, like Peter, I don't believe that I will catch fish in the middle of the day. Okay, it's okay. He said, no, sir, you don't understand. Economy class is full. And we want you to fly first class. Oh. Would you call that a great catch? Yeah. I got to Thailand. Spicy food. <laughs> Cubano. Eating spicy food. But now I enjoy it. That's another great catch, let me tell you. It has been difficult. But in the last seven years, the Lord has shown me He has a plan. And that's what I want you to know this morning. The Lord has a plan for you. I'm sharing my story so you get to understand that the biblical principle that we find in the discipleship cycle is true. Maybe you don't have to become a pastor like me, but truly I'm telling you the Lord is calling you to serve Him, to give your life to Him, to get into that cycle with faces one, two, and three, and be able to be ready for His kingdom. And now I can read to you verse 11. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed Him. Now you understand that Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20 are just a trailer. This is the director's cut. This is the real thing. And the end of the story is just amazing. They left everything. At what moment they left everything? At the peak of their careers as fishermen. That doesn't make any sense. When they were doing great, the greatest catch ever, and now they leave everything. Boats, fish, nets, everything. And they follow Jesus. This is... The discipleship cycle is an illustration of the plan of salvation. God looks for us. He meets us where we are, as we are. He shows us who He is and who we are and how much we need Him. And then He goes on to say, I want you to tell others 
that I am also finding them. That's the plan of salvation in a nutshell. And when we understand the plan of salvation, we are ready, like May said earlier this morning, to be good followers, to do what Jesus says and go wherever she lead, wherever he leads. May is going to sing to close the message almost this afternoon. And as she sings, I want you to have a personal prayer with the Lord. I want you to tell God, I want to experience the discipleship cycle. I know you are looking for me. I know you love me. I know you care for me. Help me see it and understand it. I want you to tell God, show me who you are and show me who I am. And transform me. And I want you to tell God, if you call me Lord, I will serve you. I will go wherever you lead. And after the song, we will pray together to reconsecrate ourselves one more time to the Lord.
we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity you are giving us this morning to remember the discipleship cycle. And I would say even the salvation cycle. You look for us and when you look for us, wonderful things happen. And then you tell us, this is who I am. You need me in your life. And when we come to understand that, we fall at your feet and we say, go away from me for I am a sinful person. But as we say that because the Holy Spirit is convicting us, we hug your feet and we say at the same time, I cannot go away from you, Lord. And then you tell us, go ahead and tell others that I'm finding them as well. Thank you for reminding us. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the ministry that this church has here in this country, in this city, in this community. Seventh-day Adventist church community. Seventh-day Adventist church community should be the way because this community is called to be your church. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit may empower us. So as buildings are, are being built around us, as condos are being constructed, we get to understand that this is our mission field. That there are people out there hoping to hear that a powerful God is finding them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.